Uh, and welcome to what I believe is the first in a Snack and Learn series from WSP. My name is Lawrence Penn and today I'm going to be talking to you about the role of e-cargo bikes in zero emission urban freight. Uh, so I work in our future mobility team uh, and we're focused on the introduction of new types of transportation and business models within transport um, across a wide variety of different things. But today we're going to be focusing on freight and zero emission freight in particular. Uh, so we'll make a start. So what we're going to cover today, well, we're going to start by introducing cargo bikes and exploring all the different forms that they can take uh, before moving on to the current challenges for urban areas uh, and how e-cargo bikes can help to solve these challenges. And we're going to do this by looking at a couple of case study examples uh, and some of the supporting infrastructure that we can use. Uh, and then by looking at a few lessons learned from our trials that we've been conducting here in the UK, uh, as well as exploring the barriers and enablers to e-cargo bikes, what's next to e-cargo bikes, and then finally a Q&A session at the end. Uh, and you can post your questions in the chat box throughout this session. Um, and if you do want to look at this presentation in more detail afterwards, you will find this presentation uh, in the handouts box within the GoToWebinar. So introducing e-cargo bikes then. So cargo bikes as a mode of transport aren't particularly new. They've been around um, quite a long time but of course with the addition of the electric motor and the battery they're far more capable allowing them to have a range of approximately 30 miles on a single battery and in many, many instances carry in excess of 100 kilograms of cargo uh, and this is up to a couple of cubic meters of space so by comparison a small electric van might carry around uh, four cubic meters of space and due to their small size their lightness uh, and their lack of any tailpipe emissions they're very well suited to dense urban environments uh, and they can go where van, vans can't, for example, using the uh, the cycle network and sort of loading on the pavement rather than having to rely on loading bays. Um, and apart from this, very low running costs, so they, there is also a commercial incentive there for operators. Um, and from a regulatory perspective, in the UK at least, they're classified as just electric bikes. Um, so we can see that they come in many different shapes and sizes for many different um, applications and We'll dive into a few of these a little bit later on in the presentation. Uh, but of course, these are all commercial activities that we can see here, but they also take another form that is as family bikes uh, in transporting small children, uh, groceries, and indeed, as we can see, dogs. So let's take a little bit of a step back then and assess some of the challenges that we're facing in our urban areas. So first of all, I think we have to admit that we have a van problem. Uh, here in the UK, we've seen a 124% increase in van mileage between 1990 and 2019. Uh, and this is a huge increase. Um, and whilst it's only resulted in a 65% increase in greenhouse gas emissions due to improvements um, in emissions and yeah, engine technology, that's still a notable increase. Um, and it's reflected in the van sales that we've seen in the last 25 years. And you might say, well, you know, increasingly they're electric vans, but this is only solving part of the problem. Uh, not least because only 0.2% of electric vans in the UK fleet are classed as ultra low emission um, and 12% of all of these uh, exist in London so it's not a very well distributed uh, revolution in terms of green technology and the types of trips to do interestingly most of them are within 15 miles of their base um, so these are yeah short journeys within urban areas predominantly uh, and potentially those that would be better suited to a smaller, lighter, cleaner vehicle, such as an e-cargo bike. And of course, if you electrify a van, you don't solve the issue of congestion and you're stuck in the same traffic. Also looking at our cities and how they're changing. So currently around about 50% of a city's footprint is dedicated to the motor vehicle. And as you know, people live in cities, not cars and vans. Um, so we're starting to see, fortunately, the reallocation of road space in urban areas by flipping the modal hierarchy, prioritising pedestrians, cyclists uh, and other vulnerable road users, and also the creation of low traffic neighbourhoods by blocking off certain roads uh, to stop rat running and making it, I suppose, more inaccessible to motor vehicles and much nicer places to live. We've also got uh, policy levers such as clean air zones and congestion charging, uh, and there's a lot of buzz at the moment, uh, particularly in the UK, about road user charging too. Um, so, again, these are all policy levers to incentivise people to use alternative, cleaner modes um, and potentially set the scene for e-cargo bikes. And clearly these have a role to play in filling that gap that's created by these interventions. Property market too, so we're seeing an increase in city centre, uh, particularly retail unit prices, as we can see from the graph on the right hand side. Um, and 
with the uh, with the prices increasing, we're starting to see a reallocation of space uh, to more profit making functions, more focus on experiential retail. And this will result in less storage space, which means smaller and more frequent deliveries. Very well suited to e-cargo bikes who can make much more frequent deliveries in those denser urban areas uh, and potentially a, a benefit too for um, the logistics operators to optimize their fleet more efficiently so that they can be running at capacity which of course is uh, of a commercial benefit and moving on now to the growth in e-commerce so particularly during lockdown we've seen a massive growth in online retail and this is good news for logistics operators because they're doing lots more business However, from a sustainability perspective, it isn't very efficient having lots of vans running around the houses uh, rather than people traveling into a central location, hopefully via public transport or active travel uh, and doing their shopping there. Furthermore, um, in the automotive industry in particular, we've seen a semiconductor shortage uh, and this is adversely Im impacting the supply of new vehicles and um, it means that potentially people are running older vehicles for longer, which of course means that they're more polluting. Um, furthermore, this, on top of this, we've got growing customer expectations through the likes of Amazon Prime and next day delivery. Um, so perhaps instead of receiving uh, your, your toaster and your hairdryer uh, on, in a consolidated delivery, you opt to have both of those delivered on the next day. Uh, well, or, or on separate days potentially, meaning that we've got two separate deliveries rather than uh, a more efficient single delivery for multiple items. Um, and clearly this is not sustainable um, and this growth in online commerce is only going to result in more and more vans uh, that are sort of creating those same problems that we've discussed previously. So to summarise those challenges then uh, that our cities are facing, big growth in van sales, um, which isn't particularly conducive to our push for zero emission, uh, net zero. Uh, electric vans, whilst they are uh, starting to enter our streets, they're not solving all of the problem. Um, so we want to be prioritising cities to work for people and cyclists uh, rather than uh, yeah rather than the motor car, and we're doing this through a number of different ways: access rest restrictions, uh, but also policy levers such as clean air zones, and this is creating additional cost uh, for existing operators of vans. So potentially a need there for a smaller um, and more agile vehicle to do more frequent deliveries uh, to retail premises, and. This is all in the sort of wider picture of looking at how we can satisfy the growth of online delivery and uh, deliveries to retail premises more sustainably. So moving on then, um, how can e-cargo bikes solve some of these challenges? Um, so I want to go through a number of different case studies now, um, looking at the different and innovative ways that e-cargo bikes have been used um, all, all across the world. So this is a really interesting example from DHL, uh, and they've employed this city hub concept um, it's currently in seven different cities and expanding, uh, but most notably in Frankfurt and Utrecht. And the way it works is you've got the standardized con containers that can move very efficiently and quickly between different modes. So you can see in the image at the top, um, a few of these containers have been towed by a van into um, an urban area where they're transferred onto an e-cargo bike for that last mile. And the dimensions of these uh, these containers are also um, the, the designed to work with international shipping containers. So potentially one of these boxes could be uh, shipped from China all the way uh, to you know just, just a mile or so from their destination in this box uh, and it's a really efficient way of handling goods and keeping costs down. Uh, and as you can see huge benefits to be realized from um, operating this way so 16 tons CO2 equivalent per year um, and yeah uh, a good majority of those inner city routes can be serviced in this way and they do rack up the mileage so 50 kilometers covered per day um, and the lifetime ownership costs those operational costs much lower compared to a van. Um, last mile logistics so um, micro consolidation is something that you'll hear pop up a lot uh, when we're talking about e-cargo bikes uh, it's been employed very successfully by Zedify here in the UK um, so we'll cover it in more detail later but it's essentially uh, the installation of urban depots on the edge of urban areas to intercept uh, deliveries bound for the centre, where deliveries are then remoded onto a much more clean and efficient vehicle such as yeah, the e-cargo bike. Um, ZFI uh, expanding rapidly into lots of UK cities at the moment and they're finding that during peak times it's as much as 50% faster and really significant carbon savings, so 90% per kilometre most traditional van and even over an electric van, 91% uh, saving. Um, and then, of course, not just about carbon emissions, it's also those other harmful uh, harmful emissions such as uh, nitrous oxide and particulate matter. 
Moving on then to waste collection. So I think this is a, a really interesting example of e-cargo bikes finding their niche in the place. Um, so Hereford, anyone who knows it, is um, a very historic city. Uh, lots of narrow streets zigzagging around uh, and not particularly friendly to motor vehicles. Um, this meant that it was very difficult to collect commercial waste using traditional uh, you know, refuse lorries that, that you'll see around. Um, so lots of waste just ended up going to landfill. Um, but spotting a gap in the market, Hereford Pedicargo um, developed this innovative use of deployable bins that could be just sort of slotted into those narrow back streets and then towed away as and when required by an e-cargo bike. Uh, and this saves thousands of tons of waste per year going to landfill and from a business's perspective as well, it results in reduced overheads and delays. Um, so win-win for everybody really, really there. Um, moving on to laundry collection, perhaps another similar um, a similar application. I was in London the other day and I saw these guys everywhere. Um, so they're a low carbon um, laundry company uh, and you know these really innovative techniques to wash at lower temperatures etc. Um, and London's got an ultra low emission zone which means that vehicles entering it are charged every time they do so um, well, on a daily basis whereas electric cargo bikes of course are exempt from this charge. Um, and furthermore there are operational efficiencies in terms of being able to park right outside you don't need to rely on loading bays, you can pretty much just hop onto the pavement right nearby. Um, and once again, significant um, CO2 savings uh, and yeah, a huge amount of mileage covered. I'm not sure what that is in uh, kilometres, um, but significant. Uh, Micro-mobility, so um, e-scooters and e-bikes as part of a shared scheme are becoming really popular um, all over the world really. And um, why not use e-cargo bikes to redistribute them? So um, SPIN, which is uh, Ford's micro-mobility unit, co-designed this, uh, this e-cargo bike that we see in the bottom right there with Eve, um, a British manufacturer. Um, and each vehicle can carry three e-scooters as well as a uh, load of different batteries and a mobile toolbox. And they used to keep the fleet going. Um, so sort of end-to-end -end zero emission solution, which traditionally would rely on vans um, to, to move them around. But I think this is just a really interesting and innovative application. Um, and it's all helping the scheme to be carbon negative by 2025. Also used by tradespeople. Um, so in the top right there, we've got a plumber who's uh, swapped out his van for an e-cargo bike in a bid to uh, challenge the sort of perceptions around uh, the, the white van man stereotype um, and creating a bit of a unique selling point for his business. Um, and he found that he's experienced much shorter journey times, especially during peak hours, uh, and his fuel costs halved. Um, and as well as differentiating his business from others, um, yeah, of course, huge benefits for um, his own health as well, staying much more active. Um, and it isn't just limited to plumbers, of course, uh, huge potential for other tradespeople, any any trade really. So we've got mobile bike mechanic at the bottom there from Shimano workshops. But they could be music teachers, beauty therapists, electricians, you name it, um, all with that mobile toolbox. Um, we mentioned family bikes very briefly earlier, um, and if you if you live in places like uh, the Netherlands or Denmark, these won't particularly be a surprise for you. Um, and indeed, family bikes, adaptive cycles have been around for quite a long time, um, but recent developments in battery and motor technology have made them far more far more capable, and indeed they're becoming cheaper too. Um, so it's starting to be accessible to far more people, um, and very popular as an alternative to a second car, um, and a much more sustainable. Um, and healthy alternative. Uh, and people also use them to do sort of deliveries of their handmade goods, you know, bit, uh, baked goods, cards, or whatever it might be. Moving on now to looking at some of the supporting infrastructure. So this is infrastructure that we can put in place to accelerate the growth of e-cargo bikes um, and family bikes. Uh, and many of these also benefit just general cyclists too. Um, so, unsurprisingly, first and foremost, we've got improvements to the cycle network. It uh, really is essential. Um, so, in, in logistics in particular, the, uh, the profit margins are very slim. So, any journey time benefits that you can realise over and above those of vans uh, is going to be hugely beneficial. Uh, and, yeah, this means much more direct, safe, accessible cycling infrastructure. Uh, but also at junctions, giving priority space to cyclists. Um, and this, this links really well into uh, you know, various developments around 20-minute neighbourhoods uh, and all that sort of thinking. Um, Micro-consolidation hubs. So we alluded to these earlier. Um, so these are locations at the edge of urban areas that intercept deliveries bound to those central locations. In the traditional model, uh, we might have a, 
a big HGV delivering uh, delivering goods to a sort of yeah suburban logistics hub, and then the vans will take it around the houses. Uh, and these are normally located on motorways as well, so really uh, you, you're mandated to use uh, polluting motor vehicles. And yes, you can use electric vans, but once you get into those central areas, they don't interface particularly well with pedestrians and cyclists, etc. So what we do um, is we place these hubs right on the edge of urban areas, and it offers an opportunity to remode um, that freight onto a yeah a more livable place friendly vehicle um, and of course there is an additional cost in handling these goods uh, an additional um, yeah an additional time however with those benefits uh, realized through um, yeah drop off frequency which really is the currency of logistics um, there are commercial models that are starting to be workable now Loading bays and parking. So, well, one of the benefits of e-cargo bikes is that you can park them anywhere, but in some of the most dense urban locations, uh, it might be a good idea to install uh, dedicated parking. Uh, and this makes it much easier to keep the sort of bikes off the pavement and stop them cluttering up the area. Um, but it's also a good way of visibly demonstrating that you're providing an alternative to uh, an, a traditional loading bay for use by a van. Uh, and some locations might include charging as well. Um, and we can see in the bottom right here, we've got a shared e-cargo bike scheme. Uh, this is in Hackney, I believe. Um, so yeah, innovative applications for people to use them as well as businesses. So on to trialing e-cargo bikes. So we've been working with the West of England Combined Authority to deliver a suite of e-cargo bike trials as part of a future transport zone. Um, so this is funded by the UK's Department for Transport and includes a wide variety of different projects, including mobility as a service, mobility hubs, a data hub, uh, dynamic demand response of transport, um, as well as our own project, um, the one I've been working on, so sustainable um, freight, and uh, of course there are e-scooters out and about as well. Um, so what WSP are hoping to do is create an, a blueprint for e-cargo bike use cases, um, and we really want them to be repeatable across uh, a range of different locations. So there are any number of hospitals across the country, uh, and indeed university campuses, um, so looking at a range of different activities uh, within e each of those that we can then export very easily um, and share all the learnings that we've developed. So the key challenges in each of those loca locations, um, a van pretty much tends to, tends to be used for everything. Um, we're very used to, in transport, thinking about you know, moving people onto more sustainable modes, walking, cycling, public transport, etc. Uh, but the same hasn't really been true for, um, yeah, for freight and logistics. Uh, so what we're trying to do now is explore these innovative uses of e-cargo bikes um, and find out what works, what doesn't. Um, and particularly on these campus locations, we've got very close interfaces with uh, pedestrians and cyclists. So e-cargo bikes really are a much more suitable vehicle. Um, and lots of these organizations too want to show that they are making demonstrable progress towards their net zero targets. And this is a really good way uh, to yeah, prove to everybody that they're doing something about it. Um, all of our trials are accompanied by uh, a fully fledged monitoring and evaluation strategy um, and this is all done through our working groups so um, we've got uh, they're constituted by the nominated riders we've got sort of uh, key contacts within each of the host organizations um, and we can all work together to share the learnings across the different use cases that we're developing um, so each of the vehicles are GPS tracked uh, and that includes the vans as well so we've got a baselining period ahead of the trial starting um, and we can create a direct comparison between the e-cargo bikes to derive all sorts of different metrics such as um, yeah, fuel savings and therefore carbon emission savings um, as well as route efficiency so we mentioned that e-cargo bikes can make use of the cycle network so showing yeah, demonstrating improvements there in operational efficiency too uh, and these are backed up by more qualitative approaches so activity logs you know how did you find the e-cargo bike today how capable was it in undertaking that activity, as well as extended interviews with the riders. Um, so capturing, uh, particularly yeah, in the UK, perhaps those seasonal variations in, in opinions. Um, and some of the lessons learned so far, um, so we're shortly due the, for the trials to hit the ground. So, um, and, and I believe we're returning in uh, November in the Snack and Learn series where we'll be able to provide an update on uh, things that we've learned with the trials actually having started. But at this stage, um, procurement has been a big issue, so um, yeah, public sector procurement processes are uh, yeah notoriously difficult, long, complicated, uh, and this is something that's had quite a lot of time to uh, 
yeah to our sort of program um, and also driver rider behavior change so van drivers it's very often quite difficult to persuade them to yeah ditch the van and opt for an e-cargo bike instead although what we are seeing is that um, one of our host organizations has advertised for an e-cargo bike rider specifically uh, so that'd be an interesting comparison um, of course, for those existing riders, uh, well, or drivers rather, uh, it's not in their contract to be riding around any cargo bikes. So we're looking at other incentives such as um, lunch vouchers uh, and uh, facilities for people to, um, you know, eat. Whereas they would have eaten their lunch in their van, perhaps we need to provide alternatives. Um, but furthermore, just general administration communication. Uh, lots of these organizations run quite lean, which means that there's not a lot of capacity to invest time in these sorts of projects. Um, so we're trying to really help them as much as we can in terms of doing a lot of that legwork for them, make it as easy as possible. So thinking more broadly then, uh, look at some of the barriers to e-cargo bike op adoption. So we've discussed the quality of the cycle network, um, but more specifically, we're quite worried about physical barriers. Um, so e-cargo bikes being much larger uh, need to be accommodated by larger cycle lanes um, and also we, we'd really want these sorts of barriers these chicane barriers to be removed and this isn't just a benefit to e-cargo bikes but also uh, perhaps people with reduced mobility who use adaptive cycles uh, really important um, that the network can accommodate them in order to have an inclusive active travel um, revolution and at the moment um, our WSP is developing an e-cargo bike and adaptive cycle routing tool uh, which can perform route audits uh, of infrastructure to identify those places where e-cargo bikes should be going but aren't going and therefore need an intervention. Um, so other other barriers that we've seen, so there's the market maturity, uh, particularly in terms of the um, yeah, e-cargo bikes aren't nearly as well developed in terms of you know them being actual product products as regular e-bikes. And this means that they haven't undergone the same uh, stress testing, etc. Uh, and are slightly more liable to break down. But this is improving all the time uh, and you know, operators are finding out which ones work and which ones don't work so well. Um, the yeah, the aforementioned uh, micro, uh, semiconductor shortage also applies to e-bikes, um, so it's about sort of three months maybe wait for some models uh, and then we spoke about those infrastructure barriers as well, so really cutting those journey times, making them more competitive against traditional vans. Key enablers however, so financial support you, know, you might say, well, what's to stop someone just jumping into a second-hand van? It's probably the same price as some of these e-cargo bikes, uh, which can be as expensive as £12,000 and it's $30,000. Uh, many are cheaper than this. Um, so we really need to make the green option the easy option from a financial perspective. Also, space for logistics, uh, thinking about market consolidation. It's becoming increasingly difficult to find light and medium industrial units that are correctly located for these purposes but also just getting people to know about them a bit more. So public knowledge is really important in uh, ensuring that the sea cargo bike revolution can happen um, because lots of people who try them, get on with them really well, but it isn't the sort of first option. So before wrapping up then, uh, I just want to look uh, to the future and um, look at what might be next for e cargo bikes. Some admittedly a little bit sillier than others, um, but perhaps reinventing the rickshaw. So we can see here, uh, this is an Eve cargo bike, which has been reconfigured to carry people uh, with uh, mobility needs, or potentially new new entrants into the market. So this is a, an e-cargo bike by Volkswagen. Uh, they clearly realised an opportunity here for micro mobility. Also, maybe e-cargo bus, mass transit via e-cargo bike. Why not? Uh, this is a picture from the Netherlands. Uh, also, heavy goods cycles. Uh, perhaps a question here around when does an e-cargo bike stop becoming an e-cargo bike, how large can they get? A regulatory question for the future perhaps, but some interesting applications nonetheless. And uh, yeah, my favourite application, um, dog transportation. And that is about it from me. Um, so thank you very much for listening um, and I welcome any questions that you might have. Thank you, Lawrence, for a fantastic presentation. Love the dogs indeed. <laughs> so before moving into the Q&A period, I would like to remind attendees to enter your questions in the question box on the GoToWebinar platform. And also you can download a PDF version of the presentation from the handout box on the dashboard. I will start with the first question. How successful have the e-cargo bike been in rural areas? 
yes, it's a really good question. So clearly, e-cargo bikes are best suited to those dense urban areas um, where they can be competitive against vans. And what we tend to find in more rural areas is that the, the road infrastructure is far more conducive to van use. However, it, it isn't necessarily about um, yeah, the, the form of the, the area that matters, it's about the value proposition. So it might be that within your sort of small uh, market town or village, there's a really high demand for local produce, uh, but people don't necessarily you know, drive in or um, walk into the town centre to get it. So there could be an opportunity there for an e-cargo operator um, who can perhaps offer a digital version of a high street and then do those deliveries out to the local population. Thank you. What is to stop people from just using a cheap van instead of uh, an e-cargo bike? Yeah, so again, I think it comes back to um, A, creating those financial incentives uh, to make e-cargo bikes an attractive option, um, B, making people more aware of e-cargo e bikes as an alternative, but also from the perspective of authorities, I think it's really important to bring in those policy levers which we mentioned at the bottom, uh, at, at the top of the pro uh, presentation. So talking about uh, clean air zones, congestion charging, uh, and perhaps road user charging in the future as well. So really setting the scene, carrot and stick for e-cargo bikes. Thank you. How uh, capable are e-cargo bikes up steep hills? Um, so uh, the ones I've ridden um, have been surprisingly capable. Um, yeah, a huge amount of power can be produced from those motors, so they're 250 watts. Um, and even with a heavy load, you, know, you can make light work of uh, quite steep hills and even overtake people who aren't on uh, electric bikes as well. So I'd say, yeah, have a go on one if you get the chance to, they're surprisingly capable. Thank you. There's a question here about safety. How how, how safe are e-cargo bikes? Uh, so I think e-cargo bikes, uh, first of all, being uh, larger from the rider's perspective are much safer. So the, the most common type of accident on on a bike is going over the handlebars. Uh, but due to the design of e-cargo bikes, you, you're very unlikely to do that uh, on a much larger e-cargo bike. Um, so that's sort of a, yeah, a big step towards them being safer. But of course, as our cities change and the infrastructure becomes better, safety will also improve. Uh, and furthermore, as people become more aware of e-cargo bikes, they'll sort of know how to behave around them. Um, and that will lead to improvements in safety as well. Thank you. A question about uh, insurance uh, for the goods. Uh, do you know, uh, do you have any inform information about uh, insurance for goods carried on um, the e-cargo bikes? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say only that um, the large logistics operators such as DHL, etc., they're, they're really keen on getting behind e-cargo bike logistics. So clearly um, it's something that has been able to yeah, be sort of cleared it quite easily and their systems are all integrated end to end to allow for goods tracking. Um, so I'm only assume it's a problem that's been solved, um, but I don't know much more than that, I'm afraid. Thank you. Another question is, uh, are current cycle lines infrastructure standards suited for delivery cargo bikes or would we need to rethink spaces once again? So uh, I can only really speak for the UK, but the guidance in the UK, uh, LTM 120, um, it does mention e-cargo bikes sort of fairly briefly and it does mention the uh, wider whips, need, whips needed but I think you know regulation is one thing uh, and the real world is quite another there's quite a lot of legacy infrastructure out there that certainly isn't suitable um, so I'd, I'd encourage anybody who is involved in designing uh, cycle lanes etc to think about these larger vehicles and then say not just free cargo bikes but for users of adaptive cycles as well. Thank you. I will take the last question. Um, do you have any models or examples of micro consolidation hubs? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I mean, you, you can look at lots of different cities, particularly in the UK. So in London, um, thinking about the city of London, there's lots of micro hubs uh, dotted around that enable these sorts of deliveries to be made. Um, ZFI, which we mentioned earlier, uh, so they're operating in Cambridge, London, Bristol, Many others that are missed, um, but they're all they're all operating using the same model. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you look at any of those operators, they'll all be they'll be doing this, um, and you'll be able to find examples. Fantastic, thank you. So we're at the end of our webinar session. Uh, thank you, Lawrence, for a fantastic presentation, and I look forward to the presentation uh, in November.
with the results from uh, from your project. So please feel free to follow up directly with Lawrence with any additional contacts via the contact details. Sorry, with any additional questions via the contact details shown on the screen. And I would like to thank all attendees for joining today. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. I will wrap up the webinar now. Thank you.